Now, according to schedule, we have reached chapter nine in this book, The Mortification of Sin, and it begins on page 54. So I will be making reference to that as we proceed. Now, having said that though, uh, I must begin with a, uh, a reservation. That is, after reading this chapter and reading it several times, I'm still not entirely clear on what I have read. It reminds me of the experience of Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. Somebody once asked him, for what are you most thankful of all? And he said, I'm so thankful that I have understood every page I've ever read. Well, bully for him. <laughs> I wish I could say that, <laughs> but uh, not at all. Now, the author of the book, John Owen, is one of the most famous names in the history of the Puritan movement, a Oxford scholar who for a while was a Congregationalist, for a while was a Presbyterian, but his theology was solidly a Calvinistic. Uh, like other Puritans, though, he majored on volume. For example, if you were to look at his commentary on the book of Hebrews, you wouldn't look again. <laughs> it runs to 4,000 pages of very dense material. And while I admire and agree with the theology of the Puritans in general, I do not appreciate their verbosity. I'm always telling my students, say what you mean, mean what you say, and do it in the fewest possible words. And we'll all be better for it. Puritans didn't get that message for some reason. And uh, then too, in addition to the stylistic problem I encounter in the Puritans, there are some issues I have with them, I must confess. I find in some of the Puritans a strain of subjective mysticism which magnifies the role of introspection in the Christian life. Now, of course, introspection can be and often is a very healthful exercise. Scripture calls us to critical self-examination. That's a good thing. However, I find in many of the Puritans, or at least some of them, find an emphasis upon it, which I think is a bit overbalanced. And it reminds me of the problem that Martin Luther had while he was a monk. He seemed to be so concerned about acquiring right standing with God that he would scrape his conscience and try to find every infraction he had ever committed and then set out a stream of confessions for this, that, and some other offense. He did not yet appreciate the meaning of divine grace. He had not yet come to understand the glory of forgiveness because of the death and resurrection of Christ. And for the rest of his life, he was never quite able to divest himself of some of the introspective tendencies that caused him great personal anxiety. In fact, he called it Anfechtungen, a German word for which there's no exact English equivalent, but it does signify extreme anxiety about one's sin. And while a healthful view of sin is very beneficial, and we never want to minimize the effects of sin in our lives, and we must confess our sins regularly, remember, Christ has forgiven his chosen people because of his sacrifice on their behalf. We must magnify the grace of God and I think sometimes the Puritans went to an extreme on their emphasis about personal introspection. Another item I have with the Puritans, it gives me some trouble, in some of them I see evidences of reliance upon extra biblical revelation. In their anxiety about their sinfulness and their eagerness to combat the presence of sin in their lives, they sometimes appear to have believed that God was communicating with them apart from scripture. 
Uh, that is a very serious error. And it has led to all sorts of cultic developments in church history. Now that's not prominent in all of the Puritans, but it is in some. And where these two items are present, excessive attention to introspection and reliance upon extra biblical revelation that often produces a measure of legalism in which people evaluate themselves constantly in the light of standards which their particular group endorses, but which not in every case have clear biblical warrant. And so those are some of the reservations. Now why those items appeared among some of the Puritans is not difficult to understand. They were reacting against the formalism of the state church. The Church of England was the formal state church, the religion established by law, a church that magnified the role of liturgy and ceremonies. And for that reason, the Puritans could see how dangerous that was, and they wanted to in undertake the further reformation of that church to purify it, hence the name Puritans. Now, if I understand this book, not just this own one chapter, but the book in general, this writer was duly concerned that professing Christians not become engaged in presumption. That is a very crucial danger. There are, it's obvious that there are many, many millions of people who personally regard themselves as regenerate people, when in fact they are nothing of the sort. They are unbelievers and they don't realize it and they would be very, very insulted if anybody asked them to examine the condition of their hearts. And that warning against presumption, I believe, is really the greatest value of this book. And I, I see it emphasized again and again, even though I have not found the word presumption in the text. And so that's what I'm going to emphasize this morning, is the grave danger of presumption with regard to a person's salvation. Now, according to Owen, there are six deadly and serious symptoms of sin, which he identified. First, the firm establishment over a long period and the settlement of a habitual practice. Person, over a long period of time, become so deeply involved in a sin or sins, and therefore is no longer aware of his actual condition or the seriousness of his offenses. Another dangerous symptom is when the heart pleads to be thought in a good condition, yet all the while allows the continuance of a lust without any attempt at mortifying it. Yeah, that happens quite often. People become so accustomed to their spiritual condition, they lose sight of the sinfulness of it. And as a consequence, they do not seek to mortify a particular lust. Then the next thing he wrote was, a third dangerous symptom is when sin frequently succeeds in obtaining the consent of the will. And that I think is an obvious truth. A fourth dangerous symptom is when man fights against a sin only because of the consequences or penalty of that sin. In other words, we, in an ultimate sense, because we're scared of going to hell. And only because we're scared of going to hell will we make some serious effort to deal with our sin. That ought not to be our primary motive. Our primary motive ought to be to love God and to seek to glorify God and show our gratitude for all of his gracious provisions. An offense against God should pain our hearts with grief, not because we fear condemnation, but because we love the God against whom we have transgressed. A fifth dangerous symptom is when it is probable that trouble over sin or lust is a punishment from God. Now that may be the case. I wrote a question mark beside that in the text here. I, I don't understand exactly what he means by that. I find it difficult to fathom. It could be that there will be cases that correspond to that 
I would be very hesitant. In fact, I wouldn't do it. I would never go to a person and say, here's your problem, you have sinned, and this uh, sin is going on, and it's going to have de deadly consequences, and that's a punishment from sin, from God. So for one sin, another sin is a punishment from God. Uh, maybe, but uh, I would never be so bold as to say that. A sixth dangerous symptom is when your lust has already withstood the particular dealings from God against it. Well, once again, I think that's uh, obviously correct, but at the bottom of page 62, the last paragraph, I see another implication of reliance on extra biblical revelation. Now then, open your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going to proceed now with the subject of presumption. And these, as you know, are words of Jesus taken from the Sermon on the Mount. So keep your Bible open, and we'll be dealing with the first eight verses of the chapter. In fact, this is one of the most discomforting chapters in the Bible. It calls us to make a critical self-examination. It calls us to humble ourselves before God. It calls us to serve the needs of others from the right motive. This uh, can be a very painful experience if we examine ourselves and our profession of faith in the light of the requirements that God's word specifies. Notice how it begins. Jesus said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. This is what he said in the presence of Jewish religious leaders, rabbis and Pharisees. And he warned them that there can be a wrong way of doing right things. And if they do right things from the wrong motive, those things are not genuinely good in the sight of God, they do not please him, and the only reward people will enjoy is what they get on earth as applause from fellow men. He said, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as hypocrites do in synagogues and in the streets, so they will be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Now remember, there really are basically two types of religion. Christianity is a category by itself. Christianity is primarily concerned not with religious ceremonies, not with conformity to standard religious practices, not even with the performance of good works, as valuable and necessary as they are. Christianity deals primarily with a person's individual relationship with God through faith. And Christianity deals explicitly with motives and intentions, not only outward deeds. Here we notice that in dealing with the Pharisees and others, uh, Jesus was really building upon a principle that appeared earlier in the Old Testament. We read there, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so the condition of the heart should take precedence over everything else. Jesus knew that the Pharisees were renowned teachers in Judaism and rather famous for their conformity to religious practice as their religion required them. And they were in the situation then of risking that they were doing good deeds for the purpose of winning the favor and applause of others. We might call that a theatrical type of goodness. In a theater, a person plays a role. And isn't it interesting that the word hypocrite comes from that? A hypocrite is an actor. 
somebody who's putting on a performance. Well, to avoid presumption, we should ask ourselves critically, what I am doing, is it, does it correspond with biblical precept? And if it does, why am I doing it? Am I doing it for the right reason? Am I doing it because I love God and I love my neighbor? Or am I doing it to make an impression on other people? That's one of the grave dangers. And Jesus said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. So Jesus fully understood and wants us to understand that our Christian profession is not an outward performance. It, on the contrary, is a performance motivated by the interior condition of our hearts. Everything should be geared to focus attention on God and not upon ourselves. Otherwise, religion becomes a show and the people engaged in it become actors putting on a performance. Jesus cited some examples of religious practice wrongly performed. Although the acts in themselves appear to be good, they're not good by God's definition because they proceed from the wrong motive. Now the first of these is charity. Look, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets. Don't do something good in itself for the purpose of winning applause and congratulations from others. Charity, of course, is a Christian virtue, and it's our responsibility to pursue it faithfully. But the reason behind it is all important. Jesus said, in the case of the Pharisees, they have already received the only reward they're ever going to get. They want the applause of men, that's what they're going to get, and there won't be anything else. There's nothing in heaven for such people, only on earth, and they, they appear to be satisfied with that. No reward in heaven. And then there is the item of prayer in verse 5. When you pray, you're not to be like the actors, the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. A prayer, almost every person in a Christian culture would endorse prayer. Prayer seems to be an inherently good thing, doesn't it? I can remember when the U.S. Postal Service canceled letters with a statement, pray for peace during the war. Pray for peace. And it certainly seems a proper and appropriate exercise for everybody to pray. However, sin can infect our prayers and destroy their value. And in this case, Jesus dealt with people who fit that description. They chose to pray in such places to gain recognition for themselves. Now that wouldn't happen today. We're in a post-Christian culture and religious devotion is no longer as popular as it used to be. And so today, if a person stood on a street corner and began praying, he'd probably be the subject of great ridicule. But in the time of Jesus, people would admire such a person. They would heap praise upon him. Isn't he a truly good and godly person? Look at him. He's right there lifting his hands and his voice in prayer. It's a very wonderful thing he is doing. Not necessarily so. If the motive is wrong, it shows the condition of an evil heart, and it shows a person perverting prayer for personal advantage. That is not only a worthless prayer, that's a godless prayer. And people who presume on their standing with God are in danger, of course, of involving themselves in exactly that.
God is not going to be impressed by diction, by eloquence or enunciation or exalted vocabulary. God wants us to pray from our hearts. And so we don't stand on intersections to do that. But of course, this is not an argument against public prayer. Certainly not. There are many cases in the Bible that authorize public prayer. But once again, it's the motive that is preeminent in this whole matter. The Pharisees were known as people who prayed. They prayed a lot. Look at verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as Gentiles do, for they suppose they will be heard for their many words. Now the Jewish people lived in a little piece of real estate in Palestine surrounded by Gentile culture. And Gentile culture had influenced life in Palestine a great deal. And so the Jewish people were well aware of pagan religious practices. And one of those practices conspicuous among pagans was to pray the same thing repetitiously over and over and over again, hoping that somehow that would move their gods, their gods plural, to respond positively. But the Pharisees knew about that and they did not withstand the influence of that practice. They had become experts in the mechanics of prayer, just like the heathen, and so they were known to pray the same prayer over and over again. That's always a danger. Now, of course, there should be works of charity. There should be faithfulness in prayer. And in so doing, those who engage in these practices should be motivated by love for God, love for their neighbors, and seek no applause, no reward on earth. Now, it is, there is a true personal righteousness which Christians can demonstrate with love for God and be pleasing to him. And he will reward the good deeds and the faithfulness of his people. But keep this in mind. Salvation is not that reward. Salvation is not a reward for any human endeavor. No matter how intrinsically good it may be, or no matter how faithfully and sincerely it is rendered. That does not earn the reward of salvation. Salvation instead is, as Romans tells us, the gift of God. It is a gift from God, free gift from God without human earning or human merit. Salvation by works is really the pinnacle of self-pride and maybe the most damaging falsehood in history. People believing in their own ability to win the favor of God. That's a very serious, serious, and can be an eternally damning error. Remember, God is not in debt to us, we are in debt to him. And if the wrong motive takes control of our lives, then we will not be pleasing to God and we will be engaging in presumption rather than faith. The practice of true righteousness includes a number of things. First of all, our charity ought to be a sacrificial expression of our love for others. Because the second of the greatest commandments is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so if I see someone else in need and I hasten to assist that person, providing the motive is love for him, preceded by love for God, then I'm doing a truly good work. And that can be and is a necessary evidence of genuine faith. Two people might perform exactly the same charitable deed. One motivated by love for God and love for the neighbor, the other just a decent fellow who wants to help out. See the difference? It's exactly the same deed, confers exactly the same earthly benefit, but each one originates from a different motive. One 
originates from love for God and love for the neighbor. The other is an expression of one's presumption. So our charity must be an expression of our love for God and our love for others. Remember John the Baptist at the height of his public ministry? His disciples said, "Uh uh-oh, you have a competitor. His name is Jesus. And people are flocking to him. How did John respond? He said, he, Jesus, must increase. I, John, must decrease. That's the proper attitude. And where genuine faith is present, that faith will demonstrate itself in selfless love for God and others. We should pray too, of course, as as Jesus said, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In other words, when we pray, we are not engaging in a theatrical performance. We must pray sincerely. The New Testament does authorize public prayer, but nevertheless, our prayer must be a personal communion with God. God has promised to listen attentively to the prayers of his children who meet his conditions. They must, first of all, possess genuine Christian faith. Secondly, they must believe the promises of God's word. And they must pray according to the will of God as they are aware of it. Now, of course, lacking any revelation beyond the Bible, we are not in a position often to discern the will of God. We can't know it. But nevertheless, we can pray, and we can pray as Jesus taught us, thy will be done. And when we do that, that's an act of faith. Failure to operate in that way when we pray is to engage in religious exercises that express our presumption rather than our faith. Prayer, charity, personal righteousness must always be directed toward God. Otherwise, we pervert this into selfish, hypocritical deeds to honor and glorify ourselves. Unfortunately, there are many religious bodies in the world today, even calling themselves churches. They have the audacity to do that. But there's no gospel there. People do not learn the truth about God and the truth about themselves. Yet they may be involved in elaborate religious exercises which to the eye might be beautiful and impressive, as they often are. But they have a formalized type of religion. They pray mechanically. They give mathematically. They may be polished. They may be polite. They may be dignified. But they're dead. They're spiritually dead. Filled with people presuming upon God claiming right standing with God, and they have no basis for doing it. Now, one thing the Puritans did contribute was a very beneficial emphasis on that, warning against presumption. So we might ask ourselves, whom do we wish to impress? Jesus once said, that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Our motive must be to glorify God with true righteousness and obtain a a lasting reward which God will give to those who love him. He will one day say to his faithful people, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. So we then have in this doctrine of the mortification of sin, a good reason to expose presumption for what it is and to put ourselves on notice. 
that it would be a wonderfully beneficial exercise to examine and re-examine ourselves in the light of God's word and to see what our motives are in our attempts to serve. It might be a distressing experience, but if it is, praise God for it. It's exactly what we need. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. That's where we'll conclude. Let's have a moment for prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the infallible teaching of Holy Scripture. In this case, teaching that came directly from the lips of our Savior. And we look at this passage and we are likely to be somewhat troubled because we fail to conform to it entirely. Oh Lord, we make an effort and our efforts are sincere we genuinely love you, and we want to love you more. And we want to pray with love and devotion. We want to help others because you have come to our aid through the ministry of Christ. We want to be faithful people. We want to people be people who despise sin, who suppress temptation militantly and vigorously. For that is what biblical mortification requires us to do. Give us the grace to be firm and resolute in dealing with temptation and evil. Give us the grace to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, prepared to endure hardness when that becomes our lot. Give us a deep compassion for our neighbors, whether they believers be believers or not. Enable us to assist one another as we support one another in our mutual struggle against our old nature, against satanic attacks, against the evil impulses which bombard us from our culture, that we may glorify you in our bodies and in our spirits, which are yours. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.